Good afternoon. My name is James Thompson. I'm the author of Thomas Jefferson's Enlightenment, Paris 1785, which was published earlier this year by Commonwealth Books of Virginia. In an earlier comment, I explained that Jefferson decided to launch what I call his Salon Campaign by sending copies of his forthcoming book to select members of Benjamin Franklin's social network. Today I'm going to provide some background information on four of the circles in Franklin's social orbit. Three of these would become bases for Jefferson. Madame Helvetius, Madame de Hodeto, and the Duchess d'Anville hosted salons Jefferson would later frequent. Benjamin Franklin arrived in France in late December 1776, six months after England's American colonies declared political independence. France's foreign minister had by then decided to help the Americans in their war against England, but he chose not to share this fact with Franklin. To keep peace with England, he refused to receive the American emissary. Franklin was therefore left to fend for himself. Fortunately, over the years, he had built a vast network of acquaintances. One of the first men Franklin contacted in France was wealthy merchant and hopeful arms dealer Jacques de Natienne Larey de Chaumont. Chaumont immediately offered Franklin a complimentary apartment in his Passy villa. Franklin gratefully accepted the offer. In Passy, Franklin became the nearby neighbor of Madame Helvetius, widow of the controversial social theorist and Freemason Claude Helvetius. Helvetius made a fortune collecting the king's taxes. During his retirement, he became a philosopher and authored a progressive thesis on how to improve society by ameliorating the condition of France's destitute masses. To honor her husband's memory, his widow helped his friend, astronomer Jerome Lalande, create a learned Masonic society. Shortly before Franklin reached France, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters received its charter. Madame also established a salon in her Autiel home, which became a gathering place for scholarly masons associated with this lodge. In 1778, Franklin joined the lodge, and the following year, he became its venerated master. Franklin, whose wife was in Philadelphia, is said to have proposed marriage to his charming neighbor. She declined. In her younger years, Sophie de Hodeto had been close to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose philosophy of social equality remained with her after their separation. This may explain her interest in America and why she collected Americans. As an Americanista, she have, may have reached out to Franklin herself. Many of the younger men who attended her gatherings at her town home on Rue St. Honore and at her estate in San Juan were Freemasons. No doubt they were also excited to meet the renowned American. Where Madame Helvetius's guests expected to discuss matters relating to social and natural science, Sophie de Hodeto's guests expected to discuss politics. Franklin was always engaged in politics, but he was careful to keep the fact beyond his veil. As for the Duchess Donville, Franklin was probably more interested in her admirable son, Louis Alexander, Duc de la Rochefoucauld. The Duchess is described as the friend of economists. Abigail Adams said that she was tall, lean, and surrounded by academicians. Franklin would have been at home in such a circle, but her son was actively engaged in the mission he was promoting. Louis Alexander is commonly credited as the author of the first translation of the Declaration of Independence, which appeared under a pseudonym in the Netherlands in 1777. He also translated several other American political documents under Franklin's direction during Franklin's tenure in France. Each of these circles had its own progressive theme. 
Madame Helvetius's guests focused on progress through the advancement and application of scientific knowledge. Madame de Hodeto's guests expected to improve society through social reform and public education. The Duchess Donville's guests were pioneers in the fields of economic reform and agricultural modernization. Returning to Jefferson, on August 6, 1784, he and his daughter and his panther skin passed by Franklin's res residence in Passe on the final leg of their journey. A short way on, their coach turned onto a grand avenue, the Champs-Élysées. Jefferson had finally reached the city of Paris. To mark the occasion, he addressed his daughter. He noted the greatness of the city and the greatness of the men it produced. He concluded by commanding her to make the most of the opportunities awaiting her there. I shall, Papa. Their destination was the Hotel d'Orleans on Rue Richelieu at the Palais Royal. The Palais Royal was owned by the king's distant cousin. As Paris was then in a phase of rapid growth, the Duke d'Orleans was transforming his palatial residence into the world's first shopping mall and emporium. This emporium soon became a gathering place for political clubs, the majority of whose members were petty bourgeoisie malcontents dedicated to overthrowing France's oppressive, money hungry monarchy. Like Franklin, Lafayette, and Matsai, the Duke d'Orleans was a Freemason. More than that, he was Grand Master for half the lodges in France. It should not be surprising to find, therefore, that large numbers of the new men who gathered in the upper floor apartments of the Duke's bustling emporium were members of lodges controlled by the Duke. Jefferson seems never to have joined the Brotherhood, but as many as half the men Jefferson associated with during his sojourn in France probably were Freemasons. What attracted these able men to the craft? Its creed of public virtue and self-improvement placed it in the forefront of France's growing reform movement. As venerated master of the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, it was Franklin's responsibility to instruct new initiates in the details of the Masonic creed. Franklin summarized it as charity, benevolence, community, morality, education, truth, and justice. One of Franklin's protégés in the Lodge of the Nine Sisters was a young scientist and scholar named Pierre Cabany. Brilliant and charming, Franklin conferred with Cabany while writing the second segment of his memoirs. Cabany provided similar assistance to his future brother-in-law, Ed Jefferson's future confrere, the Marquis de Condorcet, when the Marquis wrote his Life of Torgot three years later. When Jefferson had settled himself, he called on Franklin. Having learned that Franklin's printer was Philippe Denis Pierres, Jefferson paid him a visit and arranged for the printing of the manuscript he had brought from America. On October 17, 1784, Jefferson established his residence at the Hotel Landron in cul-de-sac Tegbo. Not long after he took up his residence there, his deceased wife's cousin arrived from Virginia. William Short was himself a Mason and would join Franklin's Lodge. First, however, he joined Jefferson's household as Jefferson's secretary. For the next six months, the two men remained mostly cloistered at Hotel Landron, preparing the bait. In this time, Short helped Jefferson identify the passages of Comte de Buffon's Histoire Naturelle that pertain to Jefferson's correction of the Comte's faulty somatological theory. These references can be found in the printed text of the notes at the end of chapter 6. While Jefferson was thus engaged with his Masonic secretary, Benjamin Franklin was working with his young Masonic protege, polishing the next installment of his memoirs. 
When you read my book, bear in mind that Francis Cognacenti were enthusiastic supporters of America. They saw it as a beacon for social progress, and they were eager to befriend its revolutionary era leaders. Jefferson, who had not yet outgrown his Wizard of Oz methods, did not trust himself to engage with them before he finished revising and printing his text. Only after he completed this work and distributed copies of, to uh, targeted members of Franklin's social circles did he emerge from his seclusion and begin to circulate in Parisian society. This concludes my background comments on the so solar systems Jefferson would join in France. If you have any questions about this or other aspects of Thomas Jefferson's life, you can contact me at jct at commonwealthbooks.org. You can look inside the book and purchase a signed copy at www.commonwealthbooks.org. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to speaking with you again soon.